We're live. We're active. Let's get it, man. Like I said, it was your first time here. Hit that subscribe button. If it's your second time here. Boy, hit that like button. It's your third time here. Drop that joint. And today, we're back with part three. A part. What am I talking about? We're back with part three. He experienced the worst medical screw up ever. And we're about to figure out which one it was. Number one, 16 minutes. Hope y'all having a great day. If you didn't see part two or part one, slide back and look at them joints. I don't know what I'm going to call them because I'm literally doing these videos back to back to back. So, you know what I mean? I don't know what I'm going to call them. You can find them. They're going to be back to back when I post them. Yeah, let's get it. In 2006, 73-year-old Sherman Sizemore was the definition of a man's man. This is what I'm talking about. It was almost 16 minutes exact. If you was two minutes back, 16 minutes, that would have been perfect. Man. He had spent the bulk of his adult life doing one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Wait, 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 wait. How do you start this off? 73-year-old Sherman Sizemore was the definition of a man's man. He had spent the bulk of his adult life doing one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, that? mining for coal in West Virginia. And while he was a coal miner... Yo, let's pop off rip sign. I don't... Coal miners, y'all got paid good. I don't know how y'all would do it, bro. In a cave, mining all day. No ear protection. You in a cave. You got them lights. It's dark as hell everywhere. Everybody, ding, 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 ding. That's all you hear all day. Ding, ding. I don't know. Yo, I really don't know how it came out of there, bro. Like, like, he got a piece of wood right there. Like, that's going to hold everything up. Am I bugging? Or maybe he put his head on there to sleep. But if that wood is there to hold up in case it falls, boy, you're done. It's a big rock above you. I don't know how they did that. I could not. He apparently had lost track of the amount of times he had nearly been killed from mine shaft collapse and gas leaks. Later on in life, after his kids had all grown up, he had retired from coal mining and become an ordained Baptist minister. And despite his harrowing backstory and burly, intimidating appearance, he was known to be incredibly gentle and very calming to his parishioners. He was also known to be an incredibly devoted grandfather to the point where if there was a chance to spend time with his grandkids, he would basically throw all of his responsibilities out the window to do that. But in January of that year, something changed in Sherman. He went from being this pillar in the community to being a deranged, paranoid lunatic. It all started on... Dang, man. And I bet nobody gonna think about his past when it came to this. Please tell me y'all thought about his past. Because if you tell me, bro, I used to do coal mining. I don't even care if it was for a month, a year. I don't care, bro. You're gonna be affected down the road from coal mining. I don't care what you say. Like he said, how many times he's been exposed to gas leaks and almost got on me. He almost got seen. Um... Please tell me y'all thought this and y'all did not just think he went crazy, bro. Unless he did go crazy out of the cut for no reason. In the afternoon of January 19th, Sherman and his wife Ruby were sitting in their home alone on the couch, just kind of doing their own things, when suddenly, out of the blue, Sherman just starts screaming as if he sees something in front of him that's terrifying him, and his scream startled Ruby so that she started screaming, and so she looks at her husband, and he's still just looking straight out ahead. He's terrified of something in front of him, and so Ruby looks from him to where he's looking then there's nothing there and so she turns back to her husband and she's like what's going on what are you screaming for what are you so scared of but Sherman wasn't able to speak after he stopped screaming he just continued to look straight out as if whatever had terrified him had him in this trance where he couldn't look away and so his eyes are wide his mouth is open his face is going white he's starting to sweat and Ruby's starting to panic she has no idea what's happening with him and so eventually she just holds on to him and says come back to me come back to me and Sherman at some point would he kind of broke out of his trance not on cat. I would have went to right where he was looking and started swinging. I got you. Think, 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 think. We fighting a ghost. Think, 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 think. Got him. Think, 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 think. Stop him. 
he died in France, and he looked at his wife and he just says, you can't leave me or they'll kill me. Ruby has never seen behavior like this. In Gotta fight no more. Ever. This is a completely different person she's interacting with, and so she has no idea what to do. And so instead, she just kind of holds on to Sherman and prays that he doesn't start acting like that again. But that didn't happen. All day long, periodically, he would just start screaming about something that Ruby couldn't see. Now, Ruby did consider calling 911 one and getting medics out there, but his behavior was so unusual and he was normally such a rock who was so competent, who was so healthy that she didn't want to. She felt like he would just kind of get through this, that if they can just get through today and get into tomorrow, that he would be better. And so she just all day was comforting him and just dealing with these episodes. And then finally they got into bed that night and Ruby's thinking, thank goodness, we're going to wake up tomorrow and things will be better. No, he's going to start screaming in the middle of the night. Next morning, it was very obvious Sherman had not slept at all. He was looking straight up at the ceiling. He looked worse than the day before. It was obvious that he was not back to normal. And so Ruby called the rest of the family and had them come over to figure out what they were going to do. But when Sherman found out his family was coming to his house, he told Ruby they can't come inside. He was afraid they and others were conspiring to bury him alive. The only person he could be around was Ruby and his whole family had no idea what to do. Little did they know there was actually a very specific specific reason he was acting the way he was. A few months before January 19th, which smacked me in my neck because I thought it was from the coal mining. It was the day Sherman turned into this different person. A few months earlier, he began complaining of severe abdominal pains. And so he and his wife, Ruby, and his daughter, they went to the hospital and the doctor, after examining him and running some tests, determined that most likely his pain was coming from his gallbladder. But the only way to be sure would be to do some exploratory surgery and literally look inside of Sherman's gut and look at his gallbladder and see if that was the problem. And so the doctor asked Sherman, you know, are you prepared to do an exploratory surgery or would you like to just kind of wait it out and see what happens with this pain. And so Sherman talked it over with his wife and his family and they made the decision that the pain was just too much and so they would go forward with the surgery. And so on the morning of January 19th, so again this is the day that Sherman basically loses his mind, he goes into the hospital completely normal. He goes in with his wife, he goes in with his daughter, and he makes his way over to the surgery wing of the hospital. He says bye to his family. Is he having fluids leak into him because they didn't sew him back upright or something? and he's put on a stretcher bed and he's wheeled in and prepped for surgery and then brought into the operating room. And while he was in the operating room, laying on his stretcher bed, flat on his back, looking straight up at all these bright lights above him, he just struck up some chit chat with the nurses and doctors who were in the room prepping the room for surgery and they were also putting the IV into his arm. Then at some point, one of the nurses lowered the oxygen mask onto Sherman's face so the anesthesiologist could administer the two drug cocktail that would knock him out for the surgery. Sherman was scheduled to get something known as general anesthesia for this operation, where basically he would be completely out, he wouldn't feel anything, they'd do the surgery, and then he would wake up in recovery. And so once this mask was on Sherman's face, the anesthesiologist began pumping him full of the drugs that would make him be knocked out for the surgery. However, the anesthesiologist only administered one of the two drugs necessary for general anesthesia. He administered the paralyzing drug, but he did not administer the actual anesthetic that would knock him out, and most importantly, would get rid of all of his pain. And so as this mask is on his face and Sherman believes he's being given the proper dosage of drugs, the nurse who was nearby told Sherman to go ahead and start counting backwards in his head from 10, knowing full well that Sherman would pass out before he reached zero. And Sherman knew this too. He had been in surgery before, and so he happily began counting in his head. 10, 9, eight, he started to feel something, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, boom, he was out. Except he wasn't. When he reached zero in his head, counting down, he realized he had not passed out. He began taking mental stock of what was going on and he realized he could completely feel his body, but when he tried to move his body, he couldn't. He was completely paralyzed. When he tried to make a sound, he couldn't because his vocal cords were also paralyzed. The only thing he could move were his eyes. He could move them left and right. However, they had taped his eyes shut, so he can't see anything. And so Sherman is thinking to himself, okay, you know, I've been given the drugs, maybe they're slow acting, any minute now I'm gonna drift off to sleep and this will just be a distant memory. But after a few seconds, he's hearing the doctors and nurses in the room, he can't see them, but he hears them, they Oh my God, bro. 
Oh my god, that had been so painful, bro. They went into his body. He had to sit there and just take all that pain. Oh my god. He got a bag. Seemed to be moving towards doing this operation, and he's still awake. And so Sherman becomes frantic and starts flicking his eyes left and right as fast as he possibly can. And the rapid eye movement actually loosened the tape on both of his eyelids, and it created a tiny slit that he could actually look through. And what he saw terrified him. The surgeon was walking over next to him. He was getting his gloves on. And then the surgeon says, scalpel. And the nurse hands him this chrome metallic blade, and the surgeon takes the blade and begins cutting into Sherman's midsection. Sherman felt everything, but Sherman couldn't do anything about it. All he could do was rapidly flick his eyes left and right in hopes one of them would see that he was awake, that he was feeling this. But no one was paying attention to his face, so they didn't see his eyes moving around. And so the surgeon continued to cut into his midsection until he had cut out a fairly significantly sized hole, at which point the surgeon hands the scalpel to the nurse and says, clamps, at which point the nurse hands him what oh looks like God, a torture bro. device, Pass and the, the surgeon hurt. proceeds to use these clamps to pin segments of Sherman's skin that has just been cut open to his body to basically keep the hole open. And then the surgeon began tugging on the outsides of this hole in Sherman's midsection, making sure it was big oh enough God, that he could actually get a good hurt. look oh into his God. body. And every little tug is sending lightning bolts of pain into Sherman's body. But again, all he can do is flick his eyes left and right, and no one's paying attention. Scope, the surgeon called out for, and the nurse handed him a camera that he jammed into Sherman's gut. And then the surgeon said, suction, and the nurse got what looked like a vacuum and pressed it inside of this open wound and began sucking out fluids from his body. The pain Sherman was experiencing is unimaginable. Every second felt like an eternity. Forceps, the surgeon called, and the nurse handed him these metal prongs that he put inside of this hole in Sherman's body, and he used them to dislodge his gallbladder so he could get a better look at it. By this point, Sherman wanted to die. He was no longer flicking his eyes left and right. He was just looking straight out, hoping someone would finally see him. And someone did. One of the nurses standing next to him. Oh my God, thank you. Oh my God. Oh my God, he's going through freaking, oh my God, he got a bag. Please tell me you got a bag. Please tell me you got, I would have got a stupid bag. Oh my God. Oh my God, that is horrible. Oh my God, I, I don't even know what to say, bro. How do y'all, oh my God, how do y'all not check to make sure both gases are getting pushed to make sure he's knocked out? Y'all don't have better procedures. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, To the surgeon looked up My at stomach. Sherman's face and saw Sherman looking back terrified at the nurse at which point the nurse yelled out stop he's awake he's awake and the surgeon practically faints and he looks over at the anesthesiologist and, he and it's not popping the right stuff oh my god bro I could not oh my god oh my god I could not Don't tell me they knock him out and then try to wake him up. Yeah, everything you saw was a dream. No, it was not. He calls him, get over here and fix this. And so the anesthesiologist comes running over from the side of the room. He gets up next to Sherman and begins pumping him full of painkillers. And as he's doing this, he has this moment of clarity. He remembers he didn't give him the anesthetic. And so as these new painkillers that have just been introduced begin to take their effect, Sherman's eyes go from being terrified to glazed over, and he does pass off to sleep. And so now he's out and he can't feel anything. But now the anesthesiologist and the medical team realize they have a very big problem. This patient- He might have shoot you! Yes, sir! Don't, don't tell me he messed with his brain, bro. They're about to do something so they don't get sued. Just experienced 16 minutes of surgery and felt all of it. And at the end of it, when he wakes up, he's going to remember it. And he's probably going to file a lawsuit against the hospital. And so a decision was made. It's unclear if the anesthesiologist acted alone or if the entire team was in on this. But regardless, the anesthesiologist administered an additional drug after giving all these painkillers. This additional drug was called midazolam, but it's better known 
known as the amnesia drug. And like its nickname implies, anyone who gets it will forget what has just happened to them. And so the idea was by giving him this amnesia drug, he won't remember the trauma he- That is so grimy, bro. Y'all messed up on your job? Oh my- Bro, you could have- What? You're gonna give him- This is why I say at the end of the day, like you can- Yeah, I mean- my doctor, my, I don't care. Anybody, police officer, anybody, anybody, bro. Anybody. Uh, you watching, me reacting. We are all humans and regular people at the end of the day. Just because you put that suit on and do all this, that means you have the knowledge. Doesn't mean that you're not a human once you take that off. You still gonna make mad decisions. You still gonna put yourself before somebody else. Not all humans, but some people, most. I.E. them. Like, come off oh my god. Uh, oh my god. Y'all messed up that bad. It was like, let's give him anesthesia so he don't remember it and we can get away with it. Oh my god. Uh, he had suffered through during the surgery and so wouldn't file a lawsuit. And so after he was given this drug, the medical team, they went back to doing the surgery. They completed it and they got him back out to recovery. And then when Sherman woke up in recovery, he did not remember what had happened to him. Oh my god. Him at least not consciously. Those horrible 16 minutes had been implanted on Sherman's subconscious. Basically, his body recognized that he had experienced extreme trauma. However, the amnesia drug wiped away the memory of how he received that trauma. So there's this big disconnect in his memory. And so when Sherman came to in the recovery room, he immediately sensed something was horribly, horribly wrong. He was scared, he was anxious, he had this incredible sense of dread, but he had no memory to tie these feelings to. And so as Sherman is sitting in recovery, he must have tried to kind of hide the way he was feeling because he didn't even remotely understand it. He had been completely happy happy and normal going into the surgery and now a couple of hours later he's a complete mess and so he leaves the hospital that day on january 19th he goes back to his house and he sits on the couch with his wife and as he's sitting there suddenly these horrible feelings he's having they become too much and he basically has a panic attack and he starts screaming out and he's terrified of something but he doesn't know what it is and then over the next couple of days he began having these flashbacks where he would access the actual 16 minutes of Thank you, thank you. Please tell me he remembered everything. That's why we got this story. You can, yes, thank you, body. Thank you, thank you, human body, that you forced this bad memory back into his head. Thank you. I mean, I mean, not like that, but like they need to pay for what the freak they did, bro. You don't just do that to somebody. Oh, accidentally, man, they didn't, they didn't do it. Let's make him forget so we can keep our job. Let's keep it pushing. That's not, you don't do that, bro. You don't do that. And wh watching that be a crazy sentence or a fine, bro. Oh my God. Oh my torture God. he went through. But when he would see someone cutting into him and opening his chest up and sucking things out of it, he didn't think that happened to me and that's why I feel this way. Instead, he thought it was just this horrible nightmare that he couldn't escape from. And so his family did eventually start getting doctors and psychologists and all these people involved to figure out what was wrong with him. But before they could figure it out, the whole situation had just become too terrible for Sherman. And so on February 2nd, just two weeks after he came out of that surgery, he would take his own life. Oh my God. Oh my God, please. Yeah, oh my god, obviously they got their story. Oh my god Bag Believably heart whole I want the whole hospital. I want every hospital you own Broken it didn't seem real that this had happened And so they would continue to dig and dig and figure out what went wrong and they would finally get their hands on the medical report from the gallbladder exploratory surgery on January 19th. And after giving it to another doctor to look over, this doctor discovered that Sherman had in fact experienced 16 minutes of something known as anesthesia awareness, where you are awake or feel a portion of your surgery. And shockingly, this happens to 20,000 people a year. However, 20,000? How do you mess up that bad, bro? You got one job. Make sure I'm asleep and I don't feel nothing, bro. You serial? Sherman's case, forgetting the amnesia drug, just literally what he went through, 16 full minutes of this really intensive surgery that he felt, 
That is an absolute rarity. That does not happen very often. Sherman's family would go on to sue the hospital and they would be awarded an undisclosed amount of money from the hospital in 2008. Hopefully that bag was stupid. Stupid fat. Stupid. Undisclosed. Means it might be stupid. But yeah. So that's going to do it, guys. You got... Well, yeah. Like, psh, what? Let me know what y'all got in the comments. How would you... Like, I don't even know, bro, because he offed himself. Like, he didn't even get to the chance to know that he wasn't tripping. If he would have found out he wasn't tripping, this happened, he wouldn't have did that to himself. He would have still been here, most likely. But that, 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 the 20,000, how do you have 20,000 occurrences like that? And you don't have something to fix and make sure. You should, like, why don't you have the machine? Double check your, your triple check. I don't know. Maybe the machine don't start if you're not, if both gases aren't on. D -d <laughs> like what? D -d -d and they're supposed to be the ones that went to school. <laughs> I can't tell. 20,000. Yeah, all right, 20,000. 20,000? And he said, it's a rarity for it to be 16. A rarity? That shouldn't even pass one second, bro. What? Like, why why don't they just single-handedly test what each drug is going to do to you and if you're going to be awake for us to see if you're still awake or not? There's so many things you could do to make sure stuff like this don't happen, bro. Like, what the heck? Y'all need to do better at your jobs. No if, ands, or buts. It's not hard. You're making it hard. You don't care that much about people's lives. So you're not fixing it by now. 20,000. Maybe I'm bugging, but you can most definitely put a, I'm not bugging. I know you can do it, but yeah, if you enjoyed the video, hit the subscribe button. If you didn't like the video, hit the like button and tell me why. Other than that, drop that joint. We out y'all. Deuces.